and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and sometimes the future. I'm Alan Cosen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And for this episode particularly, I should mention that I've been a contributing editor of Beatle Fan for 35 years, because we're going to be talking about Apple Records, and I have an article in the current issue about exactly that. But first, let me introduce my regular co-hosts. There is Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, the last of the great steam-powered <laughs> Beatles reporters. <laughs> Who's been doing a lot of monkey stuff lately, too, but mm. hey, whatever. whatever. Um, hello. And I should mention that you can find Steve's stuff in Billboard.com, Access.com, Variety, Goldmine, various places. So, as I said, we're going to be talking about Apple Records, because it's the 50th anniversary of that once great label. And before that, though, we have a few news items to cover. And Steve, do you want to pick those up? Yep. First of all... The Ringo tour has ended. They won't be back on the road until I believe September, mm-hmm. when they when they start coming through the states. What was interesting, and I just happened to look this up today, is that they actually shortened their set list from the beginning to the end. They took out what goes on, overkill, things we do for love, and who can it be now, which is really kind of weird. But they basically used the same set list that they had used all along. That's crazy. <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean yeah. those are those are all songs people um, who went to hear that particular all star band would have wanted to hear. I think. Yeah, I, I was surprised about the about the Colin Hay song. I didn't get that at all. But yeah, the things we do for love was a major hit for Ten CC. Was it maybe just the last show, or was it the last several shows that? It was the last the last couple, I believe, because I think I looked up the last two. I mean, it's hard to imagine why. I mean, maybe they were getting tired near the end, you know, and decided to slow it down a little bit. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Okay, and there are a couple of Yellow Submarine-related items, right? Well, and, and number one, I did another hosting after we did the show last week with Paul Rattan Jr., and the show I did was in Palo Alto, and it was sold out. In fact, I almost didn't get a seat myself, but I managed to. And the sound didn't appear as good, but the crowd was enthusiastic. They clapped, and they sang along with All Together Now at the end. And, of course, the you know the picture still looked as fine, as great as it did. One interesting thing, the next day I pulled out both of my versions of Yellow Submarine on DVD, including the 1999 one, and there was one thing on the 1999 one, guys, that they didn't put on the 2012 one, and that was the isolated soundtrack. And I looked at that and I went, why the heck didn't they do that? Because listening to that, I, you know, I put it on and it was like, it's great. And it's not just listening to the album. You know, I mean, you can listen to the album. You can listen to the the soundtrack on the album. But listening to it and synced up to the visuals, it's wonderful. And why they left that off, I have no idea. And that just really blows me away that they that they did that. I was really surprised to see that. You know, that often happens with re-releases or remasterings. They often get rid of something that was useful in the previous release. Uh, it, mm-hmm. it happens a lot. I mean, you know, with the Apple stuff we're going to talk about today, they released it twice, once in 2010, and I think the first set was 1993. In the 2010 set, they added a whole lot of extra tracks and a couple of extra discs with rarities and singles and whatever, and yet Mm -hmm. there were still a number of tracks on the original versions that never made it onto this set. Plus, I think think the whole Ivy's album isn't in the box set. It was just... That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we always look for the remasterings and the upgrades as like, okay, now it's great, and then you realize that you still have to keep the old one. Mm-hmm. Yep. I have a question. Didn't you report, Steve, or I, I think I read that the Yellow Submarine song track was just re-released digitally, right? 
Well, they I don't think this is new, but they announced that it was on Amazon Music, and somebody else noted to me that it was on Spotify as well. I'm not sure if those are new. They might have been new. I seem to think Amazon uh, had Yellow Submarine song track before because I have Amazon Music and I use it regularly. I'm pretty sure it was there. In any event, it is now, but so is the movie Yellow Submarine is streaming on Amazon Prime now. And that was announced the day after, I think it was on Tuesday, uh, you know, after the Monday that I went to see the movie. It was like, oh, okay. So if you don't get to see the movie in the theater, you do have that option if you don't have the DVD. But, you know, the DVD is better because you have all the extras that you won't have on on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we'll have to look into that Yellow Submarine song track thing because the song track was done in 1999 and Paul Rutan told us last week that the soundtrack was remixed again in 2012 when he did that upgrade. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if they replaced the 1999 mix with a 2012 mix. I guess we'll have to compare some of those with the original CD version. Right, right. Well, let's get Paul back. (laughs) Yeah, let's get him back. (laughs) So we have some uh, Paul updates, too, I believe. He added two dates in Poland and in Krakow, Poland, and in Austria to the uh, Freshen Up Tour. Still no American dates outside of that uh, Austin City Limits Festival. Well, if you look at what he has booked so far, he's got four dates in Canada, and that's in September. Mm-hmm. And then he's got the date in Poland and also the one in Austria. And the three dates in the UK, that's in December. And then he's got Austin City Limits in October. So you would think that the U.S. dates, if he's going to do any, would probably be sandwiched in between. Mm-hmm. So oh, I, I have... Think I have- I have no doubt there's going to be other things. Yeah, so I would think October, November, mm-hmm. if he does any in the U.S. Okay. Over the next three weeks, he will do individual announcements of four more dates, <laughs> and we will duly report them to you folks. Right. Okay. Rogue Best's Museum is about to open, and Steve, I think you have something about that, too. Well, what's interesting there is he's been posting little, as he said in our interview, he's been posting teasers. little previews, little teasers. And one of the things he did this week was post picture of the outside of the museum. And the outside of the museum now has six pictures of the Beatles, including Stuart and Pete. And the placement is interesting because Stuart and Pete are placed first, and then Ringo, Paul, George, and John. So There's three floors above the main entrance, and then there's you know individual drawings of the four Beatles plus Stu and Pete. And John and Paul are on the first floor, George and Ringo are on the second floor, and up high above in the third floor is Stu and Pete. Mm-hmm. And then in the entrance... The entrance doors, the left door says John, the right door says Paul, the sides say Ringo and George, and then in the front, as you face the left and right side, it says Pete and Stewart. So Pete and Stewart are very prominent as soon as you walk in. You can't miss it. (laughs) So it's really um, a nice gesture there and very classy, I think. To make Mm -hmm. sure that all six of them were represented. If any of our listeners go to the opening and you want to write to us and um, describe what you saw, we could read that. Not even just the opening. Anytime if you go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to hear what what they thought of it. And we'll give the address at the end. Right. Okay, and um, Ken, you had a statistical issue about Drake (laughs) and the Beatles. (laughs) Ah, I didn't even know if he wanted to bring this up, because Drake, who is uh, one of the hottest, if not the hottest artist as far as uh, on the hit-making scene is concerned, he's a rap, hip-hop artist, also an actor. He has seven songs in the top ten on the Billboard singles charts, and that surpasses the Beatles' record. So record um, was five? Well, they owned the top five in that first week of April of 1964. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember if they had more than that before, but they've been saying that they, that Drake beat the Beatles record. So um, all I wanted to say about that is that um, it is a different era now where the singles are all digital. It doesn't really cost the record company much to make the songs available individually. So unlike back in 1964 when I Want to Hold Your Hand broke, and because of that and Beatlemania erupted, 
and we had all the previous recordings from the Beatles coming out, flooding the market all at once, and you had so many hits you know, from the Beatles all at the same time, that really was, I don't know if you'd want to call that an organic thing that just happened. This is something that the record company can just make the songs available, but at the same time, because he is such a hot artist, and there is a demand to hear his music, there's so many singles, it's not just the top 10 he's all over the hot 100 mm -hmm. and there was one article that i read about this which said that a similarity here is that when the beatles first broke here in the u.s in 1964 so much of their fan base were female and that's the same thing with drake i see so <laughs> you know it's just uh, the times they are changing okay. and like i said uh, unlike 1964 when you had different record companies putting out Beatles singles. This is all being done digitally from the same record company. You could actually release every song from an album and make it a single, and how much skin is it off the nose of uh, the record companies? Also, uh, am I wrong, or is there a difference in um, how many copies something has to sell to chart these days than there was in the 60s? I think, I think the sales yeah. figures are much lower now than they used to be. I honestly don't know. But it's always been that the chart placement is supposed to be based on both a combination of airplay and sales. Mm -hmm. And so now in this case, it's you know it's really just digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and see, that's why I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in these stories because, I mean, you're always seeing – and a lot of it has to do with you know trying to get readers' attentions. But you're always seeing artists bumping up against Beatle recording records – you know, and in this case, you know, apparently beating it. But, you know, as far as, as far, and as I was, you know, we were talking about this before we started, as far as the Beatles go, I don't know that anything is going to change what they did. Uh, and, you know, the analytics were different back then. You know, a lot of things were different. And I don't, I don't think the comparisons are justified. I don't think, you know, even with what, Drake did I, I you know I mean that was then this is now to you know go with the name of the song but uh, I mean that's that's my feeling and I presume a lot of Beatle fans probably feel the same way because I don't know that they really you know we still think about some of the crazy things that happened in 64 you know regarding you know with Beatlemania and I don't see that this changes that mm -hmm. no one's saying that it does <laughs> Well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I don't think it does. That's all. Yeah, so. and I remember like a year or two ago, Justin Bieber had placed a lot of singles on the Hot 100, and they were saying that it was reminiscent of what Beatlemania was like. But these artists can release so many singles all at once, mm -hmm. if they want to. They can release ten singles from an album if they want to. It's no big deal, and mm. be on the charts at the same time. Evidently, this is uh, very similar to that with Drake. So. Okay, then let us proceed with the business of the evening. The business of the evening, okay. <laughs> I don't want it to sound like a board meeting here, but... Uh. I know. Okay, so Apple. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of the launch of Apple Records this year, and, you know, it's a little overshadowed by the impending 50th anniversary of the White Album and the current 50th anniversary of Yellow Submarine. But Apple Records... I think was kind of a big deal at the time. And I don't know what you guys remember about it, but as I said in the article that I wrote for Beatle Fan, I, this was a label that was putting out stuff with what we took to be the imprimatur of the Beatles. So unlike something that was coming out on Columbia or Reprise or Capital or any other label, this came with what we took as a sort of special recommendation. You know, the Beatles signed these people, in many cases produced the albums, wrote some of the songs in, in, in a few cases, and so we took that as a recommendation and sort of tried things out in a lot of cases, I think, in my experience anyway, without having even heard them before. It was just, okay, it's on Apple. I'm going to get it, you know? Mm -hmm. So did you guys have that experience too? They they seem to have a, a natural uh, quality control. In other words, most everything they put out 
is stuff that fans would have been interested in. And they knew the audience they were dealing with. And actually, I mean, at that time, in that period, things were so open and it was hard to say there was any reason to limit things because imaginations were so open to any kind of music and re- radio was open to freeform radio was was very much part of the part of the game back then mm-hmm. so they were able to to do things like john taverner modern jazz quartet billy preston and, and and doris troy on the same label and that kind of artistry really displayed quite a sense of uh, judgment on their part mm-hmm. and i think that's one of the things that really made the label great is that it's wide open musical sense they appeal to a lot of different uh, tastes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i know in my case i was a little kid when all this was happening no (laughs) aside from the beatles the the group recordings and their solo recordings and being a top 40 listener Mm -hmm. more so than an fm listener Mm -hmm. i was only aware of say badfinger or mary hopkin when it was happening i didn't really know about many of the other artists that were on apple it was only later on when I would buy the book all together now from Wally Pedrazic and Harry Castleman that I became aware of everything on the Apple label. Mm-hmm. And to me, anything that the Beatles touched was something that I felt was part of their catalog, whether it be something that they wrote for someone else or produced or played on. Or even in this case, just the mere fact that they signed an artist mm-hmm. meant that the Beatles gave the artist their endorsement. So they saw something in these artists that they signed, and therefore I felt that it was important for me to study. Mm-hmm. And in the course of doing that, I began to realize that because the Beatles were so musically eclectic all over the place, that Apple Records, to me, was more of an extension of what they were, and it gave them the opportunity to be involved with all these other recordings that maybe they couldn't go as far with, say, in the Beatles. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one thing for George Harrison to do a few Indian songs on Beatles albums, but to do Wonderwall music or to produce the Radha Krishna Temple album, something like that, this was an outlet for him. And for someone like John, who wanted to do more avant-garde stuff with Yoko, there's only so far you can get on a Beatles album. Yes, you can do Revolution Number 9, but Apple Records gave him the opportunity, and especially with Zapple, to have something like Life with the Lions on there. And likewise, the same thing with George with Electronic Sound. Mm -hmm. And so to also to help out all these other artists that were on the label, Mary Hopkins, James Taylor, Billy Preston, Jackie Lomax, all these wonderful artists, it also gave them a chance to help their friends out, play on their records, maybe write a song for Jackie Lomax or co-write a song for Billy Preston and boost their careers And, you know, they were able to do more than the limitations of being strictly in the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Good points. I think there are a number of things about how the early Apple things came together. You know, in the case of the modern jazz quartet, Ron Cass, who the Beatles had brought in to run the label. I think he had worked for Liberty before. He knew the manager of the Modern Jazz Quartet, which was a completely established jazz group. And they made a deal where the Modern Jazz Quartet had an album in the can that hadn't been released yet. They'd been signed to Atlantic. I mean, it wasn't as if they were homeless. And the deal was that they would put out the album that was in the can, which was under the Jasmine Tree, and they would then do a second album. They would come to London and record another album specifically for Apple, which was Space. And in a way, I mean, I have no idea whether any of the Beatles in particular cared much about the modern jazz quartet. I mean, they have had over the years, especially back in the early days, not the greatest things to say about jazz. I suspect that by 1968-69, some of them, particularly maybe Paul, because he seemed to be the the most adventurous taste-wise, might have been listening to some jazz too. But I think that in the case of of MJQ, it might have been Ron Cass coming to them and saying, listen, this would be good for the label because here we have some completely established people that would offset, say, the James Taylors and Mary Hopkins who at the time were newcomers, completely unknown. Hmm. 
Yeah, things things happened at Apple in weird ways. You know, Ringo was having his house re- renovated by John Taverner's brother, who had a, an architecture firm. And Mm -hmm. he played him tapes of some of John Taverner's stuff. And then at the same time, John Taverner was invited to a dinner with John and Yoko. And they all brought tapes and played them to each other. So suddenly he got on to Apple. And that was, I think, a almost prophetic find because at the time John Taverner was just out of music school and starting off doing his first orchestral things. And he subsequently went on to become one of Britain's biggest contemporary composers. Hmm. It's really something with some of the artists that were on Apple, like James Taylor, who it's a shame that his debut album on Apple didn't go very far. But at the same time, if he didn't have that album, if he wasn't signed to Apple, he wouldn't have met Peter Asher. Right. And so, you know, that led to Peter representing him, helping him to get a record deal with Warner Brothers and producing him. So even though the Beatles signed James Taylor and he made a great debut album and it didn't do that well, if it wasn't for that happening, who's to say that he would have become the superstar that he is, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's a little different maybe with Billy Preston. Billy Preston had some albums on Capitol back in the 60s. But the mere fact that he worked with the Beatles and he was on Get Back and the Let It Be album and also working with the Rolling Stones gave him some more visibility. And that helped him to get a very successful career going in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So in the case of James Taylor and Billy Preston, it really helped their careers for them to be on Apple and for their association with the Beatles. And there's also the aspect that some of the people that ended up putting out albums on Apple were basically experiments. You know, one was the uh, Rodney Krishna Temple, which is one of my all-time favorite albums. I love that album. Mm-hmm. Oh. A, I, I really do. Another one was the uh, the Ivies, because I don't think they really expected the Ivies to go anywhere at the beginning. Uh, and then, of course, there was Mary Hopkins. I mean, she turned into one of the biggest... Um, record acts in in the UK and in the world actually with you know those were the day, those were the days is is such a great song and mm. it was it was a, a perfect song I mean that that was just a lot of fun you know I should point out that that the current uh, Beatle fan actually has three or four Apple stories and all through the year they're going to be looking at Apple's 50th anniversary and one of the other stories in fact two of them uh, one by Steve Prezak and one by our former colleague here Al Sussman uh, talk about for instance the Mary Hopkin album and both Steve and Al feel that Paul's production of Postcard was kind of a, a violation of what Mary Hopkin wanted to do. Well, Mary Hopkin was first and foremost a folk singer. Mm-hmm. And Paul, in some ways, tried to turn her into like a Broadway-esque type singer and do a lot of standards. Hence, there's no business like show business being covered on there. And a song like Those Were the Days, she's more at home doing the Donovan music that was on that album. And if you compare that to the follow-up album, Earth Song, Ocean Song, that's more what Mary wanted to do. And she was more at home doing that album. And that's a brilliant album, by the way. Mm -hmm. It is. Tony Tony Visconti produced that. And it's so, I would highly recommend, if you love Mary's voice, get that album. There's a song that she does there, which um, many, many people listening will know, Streets of London, Mm -hmm. which was done by Ralph McTell. Mm -hmm. She does a great recording of that song. But that's more what she wanted to do. She really felt out of place with what Paul was planning for her and to turn her into that kind of a singer, you know, the type that would do Those Were the Days. So she got her wish with Earth Song, Ocean Song. That's true. And she became more of a of an international star. She only had the two hits here in the U.S. with Those Were the Days and, and Goodbye. But she had a lot of singles in, in Europe, and she sang them in different languages, and she had uh, more hits that way. So yeah. she had more success there than in the U.S. But that's what Paul envisioned for, for Mary. And who's to say? I mean, Those Were the Days is a tremendous recording. The whole mm-hmm. production and arrangement behind that. Richard Hewson doing the arrangement for it and Paul producing it. 
brilliant. It's absolutely well, brilliant. Let yeah. me several years ago, and I don't know. I'm trying. Let's see the date. 2009. I, I didn't realize it was back that far. I interviewed Mary by email, and I asked her how she felt about the Apple recordings, especially those were the days, and and what you guys said. Pretty well sticks with what she said. Uh, but let me read this. She said, those were the days is a wonderful song, and I'll always be grateful to Paul for giving me the chance to sing it. I also recorded some songs which didn't reflect my personal taste, but the ones written especially for me by Gallagher and Lyle, such as Sparrow and Feel- Fields of St. ATN, are still my favorites. And then I asked her, which is your favorite song among your Apple recordings and among all your recordings? And she said, I'm particularly proud of the entire Earth Song, Ocean Song album. The song's production and lineup suited me perfectly. I still regret not being able to promote it at the time. I love all the songs on this album. My absolute favorites would be the two title songs by Liz Thorson and How Come the Sun by Tom Paxton on these newly release archive albums said recorded some years after i left apple there are some gems which i had forgotten about such as a leaf must fall by clive palmer on recollections which is an exquisite song but there you go i mean she said the same thing you know she said what exactly what you were saying ken that she did not particularly like all of what paul did but she did yeah. like that second she did like that second album and if you look at the postcard album just to illustrate my point Mary covered Someone to Watch Over Me, the George Gershwin song. Right. She also did um, movie songs like Inchworm, right. Hans Christian Anderson, the poppy song, Harry Nilsson. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, that's the kind of stuff that Paul wanted her to do. But even if you listen to that album, you'll, you'll sense that when she's doing stuff like the Donovan music, um, she's more at home with that, really. The Honeymoon song, which we know from the Beatles recording, she recorded for that, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to me, she just sounded like enough of a professional that she could put any of those things over. I mean, I listened this afternoon to Someone to Watch Over Me and some of the others, and, and while I kind of agree that when you listen to that next to Earth Song, Ocean Song, the latter, she sounds much more at home. But nevertheless, you know, she sings those songs. She does a decent job with them, and... You know, I kind of like the postcard album. I, I I recognize that it probably isn't what she would have wanted to do, but I think it came out okay. And I think a lot of these albums came out okay. I, I still put them on every now and then. The first James Taylor album, it's mm. okay, not as hit laden as Sweet Baby James and other things, but it's got Carolina on my mind and uh, a number of things. You know, something in mm-hmm. she moves is, uh, has been uh, lifted from by one of the famous Beatles. Right. It, it's just, a, I, I think, a really good record. Circle Round the Sun. Yeah, the Billy Preston one, you know, that's the way God planned it. It was a big hit, and we were all familiar for, with Billy, if not from his earlier career, which I certainly wasn't obviously familiar with him from playing on Get Back itself and other things on the Let It Be album. And obviously that it was going to be inter- I was going to be interested in hearing what he did on his own, not least because George played on his album. And mm-hmm. later on, I don't know if you guys have run into this, but I was watching a film once about, I think, W.C. Handy. It might have been called St. Louis Blues. Not sure. Right. And... There's this little kid playing the organ. In right. It, and it turns out when the credits run at the end, it's Billy Preston. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have seen I have seen that. Yeah, yeah. That, that that was amazing to, to find out he was in that movie. Um the yeah. movies too. I kinda liked the single that came out. Tomorrow, Maybe tomorrow. And and yeah. her daddy's a millionaire on the flip side. Played those a lot. Thought they were pretty good. Thought it was kind of beatly. Al Sussman describes it as early Bee Gees sound, which also was kind of beatly. I thought it was interesting that that was the, the approach he took. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the other thing is Steve Prezak, in his piece, he's just reviewing the first several releases of Apple. And he finds them to be a little more of a disaster than I did, in the sense that almost all the producers of these records, including the Beatles, were, as he puts it, 
novice producers, people who were not used to record production, not used to A and R, that kind of thing. And and to him, it didn't work out that well. Did do, do either of you feel that way about any of these? Not really, hmm. especially when you listen to the box set, because. When I have listened, I just think maybe it's from the remastering, mm-hmm. but it's so well done and I think very well mixed and very clean sounding with the newer versions from 2010. Mm-hmm. I think they were mixed very well. I mean, if you listen to Billy Preston's albums, they have a gospel feel because that was his style. Mm-hmm. And it was really the way that all the instruments were produced, especially the organ. It was suitable for what Billy was attempting to do. I think George, being co-producer with Billy, for someone who really didn't know gospel that much, you know, he probably learned a lot from being with Billy Preston in the first place, but he did a fine job as uh, for production work. And especially, we haven't mentioned Jackie Lomax, right. his album, Is This What You Want, is a tremendous album. Mm-hmm. It's It's got so many great songs on it, and I do like the production on it. And you got George involved with that. Right. Mm-hmm. So this was also the beginning of you know the Beatles working as producers, too. So it's kind of interesting from that aspect, but you listen to something like Postcard. I love the production on Postcard. I think everything was mixed very well. Same thing with, as far as Paul is concerned, the single for Goodbye. I yeah. think that was mixed very well. So these were the beginnings of their work as a producer and also working as musicians and songwriters for other people. And it's fascinating to study that. And it's also very interesting when you think about how much each Beatle was involved with Apple Records. Because George Harrison seemed to be the, the guy who was the most involved. And he really worked with a lot of different people, like Billy Preston, like Jackie Lomax, the Doris Troy album as far as being a producer and playing on Mm -hmm. he really was very supportive of these artists not that the others weren't but he did a lot more work i feel than the others yeah john probably did the least well yeah for yoko elephant's memory and david David peel Peel. yeah well how do you feel about those albums elephant's memory and david peel Hmm. elephant's memory i think is 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 a little more as more accessible than than David Peel. I, I remember I remember when the David Peel album came into our newspaper office at San Jose State. I I was like, wow, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and listening to it, you know, never changed that because Peel was what he was, and and John put him out there. I mean, it was like putting out something that uh, today that that people wouldn't wouldn't be able to take very well. John kind of threw him out there as an experiment, kind of almost what he did, what he did with Yoko. I think Yoko was. A different issue though i mean peel was a street musician and that's what he was selling and it was funny though to see peel for example on the mike douglas show playing in front of all these housewives and all these housewives are listening to his his voice and he didn't have the greatest voice um but <laughs> that's an understatement that's an understatement <laughs> but you know that's what john did with him and and it was and that was part of all the, that was part of the whole philosophy of apple is that you may not get what you're expecting and that was one of the nice things about Apple was that the Beatles, much as they experimented with their music, also experimented with the label. And there were all the projects that aren't part of the basic discography that, you know, with the experiments and the demos and things of people that we've never even heard of. I mean, there were all sorts of things going on. We didn't just get to hear all of it, that's all. Right, a lot but, of things uh, weren't released, mm-hmm. a lot of things that were going to be on Zappa, like Richard Broadigan and, you know, authors reading their work. Right, um, and the D- Delaney and Bonnie album mm-hmm. um, that, that didn't come out. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that if you were to put out the full discography of Apple, and actually there are people in Europe working on projects from that stuff now, um, the A is for Apple group, if they're listening. I mean, they've been they've been putting out some books and recordings and stuff that that either didn't get released or yeah, that we've never heard of. And yeah. it's that kind of, that kind of thing going on. Well, let's say their names. It's, yeah. it's Axel Corinth and Ed Diekman. They have two thick hardcover volumes of A is for Apple. It looks to me like there will be more because uh, the first volume is 1966 to 68, so we've got some uh, Apple prehistory here. And then the second volume is January to March 69. And Apple fundamentally ceased operations, I think, in about 73. I mean, it didn't cease operations in the sense that there is still 
an Apple and Beatles things the still come out the, on an mm. Apple label, but it's not the, really. The history I have here says 70, 74, is 74 and 75 were the last two years. Mm-hmm. But by then, mm. they were only putting out Beatles stuff. Oh, okay. Like like, rock, okay. like yeah. John's Rock and Roll in 75 was obviously right. on Apple. but um, right. Extra texture. Extra yeah. texture was. Yeah. And since we're mentioning the books, Corinth and Diekman, apart from the books, as Steve uh, alluded to, are putting out also some recordings. They just put out demos by Jimmer Glynn and Alan Rackin, who were a duo from New Jersey, who went to England, met Derek Taylor. Derek arranged for them to record an album's worth of their songs, but as demos, not finished studio recordings. And uh, they were to bring the tapes to Derek when they were finished. And they brought them to Derek on April 11th, 1970. And as you can imagine, Paul (laughs) having announced the day before that the Beatles had broken up, uh, the place was in an uproar. They could barely get into the building. I think they realized that, okay, this was our opportunity sailing away into the sunset. (laughs) Wow, and that music ever came out, but they got the rights to these things, and they and they put them out on an LP. They've been digging up some really yeah. obscure stuff. Well, yeah, I kind of wonder, you know, why there are some things that Apple put out and some things they didn't put out, and have come out on other labels. It's kind of a confusing thing. The Mortimer album just recently came out mm-hmm. officially. Yeah. And uh, Lon and Derek Van Eaton, too, came out outside the Apple series. That right. came out a few, several, few years ago, their, their Apple album, Brother. Right. Uh, the one of, thing that sticks out is Elephant's Memories album. Right. right. That's never come out. Yeah. There may be rights issues with, with that, because whatever, whatever rights issues are holding up the release of the one-to-one concert, right. may be holding up that, too. <laughs> And, and and that and yeah, I, I was go- just going to mention that. I mean, because that's got to be. I mean, that's almost like let it be. It's so crazy that that thing isn't out, especially that thing. I mean, because it's been out before, and I believe you can still get the CD. The Elephant's Memory. I don't know. You know, that's really strange. Why they haven't put that out? I, it makes no sense. Mm. And also, we should talk a bit about Badfinger. We mentioned them a little bit here, but the four albums that they released on Apple were fantastic. All four of them. And there's so much great material on those albums. And it's always interesting to study them because kind of like the Beatles, they did have four songwriters and four lead vocalists, you know, and you can easily make the comparison about Pete Ham being more the Paul and and, uh, Tom Evans being John and Joey Mullen being George and Mike Gibbons, of course, being Ringo. But once you listen to those albums and you've got all these different songwriters, all with their great material, they're all strong songwriters. Mike wrote the least. But, you know, Joey wrote quite a lot of stuff with Badfinger. It says even going uh, past the Apple period. They're a fascinating band to study. They really are. And all four of those albums have so much strong stuff. It really is a shame, despite the fact that they had the four hits on Apple, that they didn't have more. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can talk about the bad management that they had and the big tragedy with the two suicides. But, you know, it really is a shame that they they should have been 10 times bigger than they were. They really should have. Mm Mm-hmm extremely talented in every way and that music is so it still holds up so well by the way going back to elephant's memory really quick the album before their apple debut is on cd but not the apple and then we should also point out that um come and get it compilation (laughs) that was on apple which had a lot of singles on there from artists who only released singles on apple that didn't have complete albums Mm -hmm. and it's also noteworthy that among the artists that later had success in the 70s was a band called the Hot Chocolate Band. Right. And they covered Give Peace a Chance, in done reggae, reggae style. style. And uh, they later had uh, a few hits like You Sexy Thing. Started out there on Apple. Mm-hmm. And then there were the Sundown Playboys, which had a Cajun track. Mm-hmm. That was that was unusual. I mean, every, all of these little contributions fill out the picture of Apple more and more stylistically. You know, the fact that all of these different styles are just coexisting under one label. Whereas in those days, 
And really until maybe 2000, most labels had a specific line for each kind of music. I mean, and it made a certain amount of sense. But at Apple, it was sort of like they were taking that old Louis Armstrong line about how there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. Mm -hmm. Can I bring up a couple of songs off that that Apple compilation that you didn't mention? Mm -hmm. Uh One would be Thingamabob. Oh, Um, yeah. yeah. One of our first four, as as they said. Right. Um, Because, you know, Paul McCartney conducted that. And and I I mean, it's a great song anyway. Another would be King of Fuh. King of Fuh. (laughs) I don't think it was actually released at the time, was it? I believe it was because I believe I've seen copies of the record floating around. You you might be right. I, uh, no, actually, well, the the liner notes I'm reading here on Amazon say it was banned, so maybe not. But I could have sworn I've seen copies, and I could have sworn I've seen Stephen Friedland, brute force, talk about copies of it. But maybe I could be wrong. Hopefully he's listening, and he, maybe he'll respond. And then the last one would be Try Some, Buy Some. Mm. With, oh yeah, with Ronnie Spector, which is a beautiful song. Uh, I I love that song. Uh, I love her version of that song. So I mean, that whole disc of of leftover songs is a beautiful collection. But I, I wanted to bring those three up because uh, uh, they were all great songs. Bring me, Bob, is so interesting because it's again. It, you, you think of Paul, he's so musically all over the place, and uh, we know one of the many styles that he likes is the dancehall music. An instrumental like that takes you back to the 1920s, 1930s. Every mm-hmm. time I hear Me Bob, I think of like Hal Roach music, mm-hmm. <laughs> the kind mm-hmm. of stuff that you'd hear with the Little Rascals or um, you know Laurel and Hardy or something like that. It also should be pointed out that, you know, I was talking about how George was so involved with the Apple recording artists. He also supported them in a very big way in bringing them on stage at the concert for Bangladesh. Right. Because he did have Badfinger there, and he also had Billy Preston there. Mm Mm-hmm. So, apart from having some other great artists like Bob Dylan and Eric Clapton, he also had some Apple recording artists at the time. And then he also continued to have Billy Preston tour with him in 74, though he wasn't on Apple then. Right. I think George took Apple as a record company maybe more seriously than the others, um, except possibly Paul. But George really, as you say, threw himself into it. And then after he sort of threw up his hands with Apple, he had his own Dark Horse label, which ended up being sort of like Apple was with the Beatles, just having George Harrison things. But it started out signing Stair Steps and uh, Henry McCullough. Splinter. Yeah, Kenny Burke. Mm -hmm. Uh, Attitudes. Yeah. And there was a story about how after the Beatles broke up and Apple was falling apart, that he and Ringo talked about running Apple themselves as a record company. And I'm not sure why nothing ever came of that, possibly because with all the the lawsuits between the Beatles and each other, and then the Beatles and EMI, there were various things going on. Maybe uh, there was too much money tied up in it that running a record label just wasn't the order of the day. But maybe, maybe, maybe given their state states of mind at the time, especially Ringo's, um, he, they probably didn't want to get into the hassle of dealing with a record company. I can kind of, maybe I'm doing a little too much speculating here, but like I said, given Ringo's situation and condition at the time, I honestly can't see him being that serious about a record company then. And but you? yet, he started his own record label. Right. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, he did, and but it only lasted. Wasn't it one release? Oh, he had a few. He had a few. You can look up the discography. The guy who wrote A Dose of Rock and Roll was on the label. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so his first release was David Henschel's Startling Music with its single Oh My My, which may have been, and since the album was an instrumental interpretation of Ringo's LP Ringo, which kind of made, kind of, right, I was going to say <laughs> the same thing, except rather than put it under a suit on him, he was at least an honest to do that. So Carl Grossman was the guy who wrote A Dose of Rock and Roll, and he had a single on Ringo Records called I've Had It back in 1975. But you also have Bobby Keys, who released a couple of singles on Ringo Records in 1975. Mm-hmm. Colonel Doug Bogey, <laughs> a British entertainer, it says here, a one-man band. That's also from 1975. 
Graham Bonnet. There's another single from Carl Grossman. Johnny Warman is on that label. Do you know who Johnny Warman is? No. Johnny co-wrote Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go with Ringo. Mm -hmm. And this dates back to 1978. So this label was around for a few years through 78, it looks like. 75 through 78. Wikipedia also says uh, he tried to sign Harry Nilsson, but Nilsson decided to go with RCA. So, And it also says that um, Dirk and Stig, the duo from the Ruddles, put out a single on Ringo Records in Europe and in the UK, Ging Gang Gooly. Ooh. See. I'd love to, hear, love to hear that. I've yeah. never, never heard that one before. Well, this opens up a whole new collecting field for me because I think all I have is the David Henschel record. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then he started another one maybe 10 years ago called Pumpkinhead. And I don't believe they put out a single thing. He announced it, and then that was the last we heard of it. And then didn't he also start a um, a furniture company too? Not to, yes. Which was which was very unusual for Ringo to to do. Okay, so we all seem to have fairly warm feelings about Apple as a label. Why did Apple not do better, Steve? Well, I'm, if you're talking about the non-Beatle things, I think that pretty well says it right there, is that Apple was basically in the shadow of the Beatles, mm -hmm. and that really spotlighted everything. And I mean, besides all the stuff we mentioned, I mean, during that time, you had the White Album, you had Yellow Submarine, you had a lot of things that took the, the spotlight off the other artists on Apple Records. I mean, some of them did, some of them did really well. I mean, Mary Hopkins is, you know, is one that I think of right away. But there was a lot of stuff that just didn't rise to the level that it probably should have. But weren't the Beatles also, in a way, a draw for Apple? Yeah. Like I said in the beginning, I bought a bunch of those records just because they were on Apple and just because it was the Beatles. Well, I mean, that's that's you. I mean, that's a lot of us probably did do it that way. But not but enough then a of lot, us. But not enough of us, because a lot of people probably looked at modern jazz quartet and thought, no, you know, why would I want something like that? Or, well... I mean, Life with the Lions. Right. I mean, there were a lot of things there that the average record buyer probably wouldn't have cared much about. And so, I mean, the thing about Apple was it was very esoteric. Maybe a little, I won't say maybe a little too esoteric, although I'm tempted to, to go that route just to, to say it. But, I mean, that may be a lot of the, the issue. I mean, basically, you remember that Apple was put together, you know, as like a talent co contest. You know, they wanted to get people to send things to them, people that didn't have, you know, that weren't signed or anything. And so really not everybody was going to make it. There was there were going to be people that are, were going to get lost in that mix. So, mm -hmm. Ken? Mm -hmm. I think some of what you said there, Steve, is true. I think that, the, you know, the music was so all over the place. I don't think the average person would be able to absorb it all. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, radio was still developing back then. It was the late 60s. FM was starting out. It was experimental. But how experimental could it be? I mean, I still don't see so many people out there accepting Yoko's avant-garde stuff, even her more commercial stuff. I'm not even talking about her screaming. Something like Approximately Infinite Universe. A lot of people just wouldn't accept Yoko anyway. Mm -hmm. But... They were all over the place musically, and it really is a shame because there's so much great stuff that came out on those albums. And in some ways, it's it's also hard for me to understand because you take somebody like James Taylor, and the late 60s, early 70s was the start of the, the singer-songwriter movement. You know, with people like James, who became a big star, the Joni Mitchells and the Carly Simons and people like that. And you wonder why that first album didn't really take off. But then I don't know how much clout Apple had as far as their promotional work. You know, I don't really know how it was in that department there. Um, but still, timing is everything. And I think that... The Beatles' intentions were really good. I mean, like I said, Apple was an extension of themselves, and they wanted it to be all over the place musically. A lot of it was very experimental, which you couldn't see radio play at all, even on freeform radio. Who's going to play electronic sound, for example? <laughs> right. Who's going to play that? You'd be lucky if you heard Wonderwall music on the radio, really. Right. But a lot of that was too far out for radio at the time. 
And just like what I said about James Taylor, I'll never understand why Badfinger wasn't bigger than they were because, you know, their albums are chock full of great songs, not just the singles. And Jackie Lomax deserved a lot better because that was really a killer album that he made. (laughs) So, uh, you know, it's tough to say, but I think it's a combination of radio not being ready to accept so much coming at them from Apple with a, a span of a few years all over the place musically. And I don't know, it could be like a lack of promotion. I don't really know for sure in that department. Mm-hmm. Hey. How about you, Alan? Yeah, I think that Beatles issue that Steve mentioned, uh, the Beatles were really a double-edged sword. They brought a lot of attention to Apple that it probably would not have got just as some label startup in 1968. But on the other hand, they so completely overshadowed everything else that was happening at Apple, not just to the audience, but within Apple as a company, it was very clear that the Beatles were the top tier. Their needs came first and everything else came second. And that makes sense, but it probably sort of sucked some air out of the room in terms mm-hmm. of other Apple artists. And then beyond that, of course, there was the fact that it started in 68 and by 70, there was the whole mess of Alan Klein and the Beatles break up and the politics and Mm -hmm. everything happening that it was just falling apart and that in the end became sort of the overshadowing thing and it just didn't quite work as well after that right that I Mm. guess is is the the sad story of Apple Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I would ask you guys to each pick three Apple albums that are you know if not your your favorites, your favorites tonight, <laughs> because so many of them are so good. I mean, I, I, I think my favorites would change almost every day. So mm-hmm. let's we'll start with Steve. Well, I'm going to go outside the Apple box a little bit. Um, I'm going to mention, even though it was a, a fan club release only, I'm going to mention the Christmas album, which, oh, yeah. sh- which should have been released this past Christmas and was not. Uh, I mean, oh, it should have been. Christmas album. I thought that you meant there was another Apple Christmas album. No. Phil no. Spector's Christmas. Well, I was going to mention that too, actually. <laughs> but I was talking about, first I was talking about the Beatles Christmas album. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was going to, uh, I was also going to mention Rodney Krishna Temple, which I mentioned earlier, which I really, really dearly love. And just to note that if you Google the Temple, and I forget exactly how to Google it, um, and you buy it through them, it comes with a couple of extra interviews, and one of them, I think, is George. So it's not a straight reissue of the album, which is really kind of cool. And it's very cheap, too. It's not – they do not gouge you. I forget how much I, – I think I bought two of them for like 10 bucks, hmm. which is nothing. So, And then the Phil Spector Christmas album has a distinction, Mr. Cozen, I'm sure you know, is that the Apple version was in stereo. Right. And it sounds absolutely tremendous. Mm-hmm. And that's on my iPhone every year. <laughs> I, I absolutely adore <laughs> hearing that album in stereo. It's just fantastic. And I also would mention, you know, just because from the regular discography, the uh, Jackie Lomax is this what you want, and Billy Preston's that's the way God planned it. Although I can mention several several more, but those two along with the the other three. Okay, Ken. This is very tough because I have to say something from Badfinger has to be represented, but I love all four albums pretty equally. Although probably the middle two probably are better than the first and the fourth. No dice and straight up. So many great songs all throughout. I'm going to have to put Jackie Lomax in there because apart from having Sarah Milk C on there, which I think was a great recording, and uh, of course George wrote it. He's got other Beatles on it, on the song. It's a great ballad there, I Fall Inside Your Eyes. There's a song called Sunset that I love a lot. I just love the whole production of it. Really has a George Harrison feel to it since he produced it. So I'm going to put that one in there. And then, hmm, it's either James Taylor or Mary Hopkins. Um, I do love Postcard. You know, I love Earth Song, Ocean Song a lot because, like we said, it's really Mary at home doing the folk stuff. But I do love the sound of her doing the standards as well. Mm -hmm. And just for those were the days alone, Mm. which is really, you know, it's not just a great song. 
the whole arrangement of that song is it's one of the, the greatest signals on Apple. It really was. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with either Postcard or the James Taylor album. Mm, well, I could relieve you of part of that choice because James Taylor is, is one of mine, so you can go with Postcard. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I just, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the best James Taylor album, but I thought it was a very promising start. I liked it when it came out a lot. And obviously that was before uh, Sweet Baby James, so it's not like I knew where he was going. I just felt that there were some great songs here, and I I thought it was nicely produced. I think I've read Peter Asher saying that he wasn't sure that it was produced in exactly the way it ought to have been, or he was terrified of whether he would be overproducing it. I think it's fine. Yeah, he's very critical of of his production. I, I, I seem to remember him at a concert I saw talking about that and saying that he wasn't sure if it was if it was done right. But I mean, it, it I think it's stood the test of time. Obviously, it's not Sweet Baby James like you said, but Taylor's talent was just so obvious there. You couldn't I think, you couldn't yeah. get away from that. Peter had said to me because I interviewed him about about this that he felt he might have overproduced the album. And especially there's some little classical interludes that are interspersed on the album that maybe he thought was out of place now. But it's pretty unique for its time, Mm -hmm. I think. Okay. So for my second one, at least tonight, I would choose Badfinger Straight Up just because it's got so many great songs on it. I think it really is Badfinger at their height. And then finally, given my other life as a classical guy, I really have to choose John Taverner. Plus, the John Taverner one is a special bargain because you get both his original, for his first album, The Whale, and the follow-up, Celtic Requiem, and a couple of other pieces too, a couple of short pieces that were thrown on as bonus tracks, although in a rock context they're not that short. One's about 11 and a half minutes and the other is nine and a half minutes. So Mm -hmm. Taverner, I think, like with James Taylor, was unknown at the time, became quite big. Uh, I like his music, generally speaking. He's uh, in these two pieces. He's a little more avant-garde than he eventually became. Ringo makes an appearance on The Whale. It's a speaking role, and it doesn't (laughs) sound that much like him, but it's, you know, there's a, a scene where there's, you know, some chaos and talking going on and and Ringo's in there in addition I mean it's another one of the ways that Apple kind of worked as a label where everybody was supposed to be colleagues when Lon and Derek Van Eaton were doing their album Brother they had the idea I think actually Ringo had the idea of having a classical interlude linking a couple of the songs, and he suggested that they get John Taverner to write it, which he did. So you get a little bit of extra John Taverner on the Lon and Derek Van Eaton record. So John Taverner uh, would be my third choice. Like Steve, I could throw in some others. I really like the Radhakrishna Temple record. Uh, I went out and got Govinda as a single when it came out. I uh, love, mm-hmm. you know, the picture cover. Uh, you, know, you know, typical Hindu art, you know. Right. Um, and very colorful, very beautiful. And, you know, I mean, these are songs that are basically Hindu religious songs in a pop kind of format. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful stuff on that record. Mm. So, think let me add one. Let me add one more thing, since okay. nobody mentioned Yoko. Okay, and mm. if I and I have to mention Yoko. I, her albums, especially the Plastic Ono Band, uh, are really, really good. And now that they're being released, re-released again, they're worth checking out. Especially that first one. It's really, it's really kind of amazing what uh, the the music on that first one. I mean, all of them are. All of them have stuff to recommend. I, I like that first one especially, though. Uh, Ringo's on it, as I recall, and so is isn't Klaus Foreman on that? Mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, but it's more rock than the than the others, as I recall. She kind of gets a little more experimental with the other albums, but that one, especially because it's Plastic Ono, and they they put those both out together. 
uh, John put his out, and her, she put hers out at the same time. So they're 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 paired up, and and for a reason. But that her Apple albums are are very interesting, and if you're at all interested in listening to her, those are maybe a good place to start. So. I definitely would recommend Approximately Infinite Universe. It's more accessible. It's more pop. If you want to consider mm-hmm. anything from Yoko to be pop, you know it was very strange for its time, and now it's like you know it's. It's so easy to for me to accept, and I can hear the influence of her and later artists like the B-52s, like John said, or Elena Lovitch, or artists like that. But you listen to Approximately Infinite Universe, very melodic stuff, some ballads in there, and somewhat quirky, but at the same time, much more easier to accept, I think, than for the people that don't really care for her screaming so much on a lot of her, like the Plastic on a Band album, for example. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay, so I think this brings us to the end of this episode, and I think we'll go around and get everyone's contact information. So, Steve, starting with you. Um, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles group on Facebook, Beatles News and Information, where I post all sorts of stuff, good stuff, I hope, on what's going on with the Beatles. You can get a hold of the show at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail dot com. You can we'd love to hear your comments on this show, on past shows like the Paul Rattan show, or suggestions of topics. And if you go to Rogue Best Museum and you want to send us a, a little report, please feel free to do it through please. that email address. Yes, yes, indeed. And also let me thank Matt Burley of Fab4Radio.com, who r- runs the shows on Saturdays and Sundays, and also to Michael Lynch for composing the theme song. Michael, we don't thank you enough. Thank you, sir. Your okay. royalty check is coming, Michael. <laughs> it's yes. a big one. Okay, Ken, how do people reach you? They can email me at everylittlething at att.net. I also want to thank Matt Burley at fab4radio.com for running my show, Every Little Thing, which you can hear on Sunday nights right before Things We Said Today at 11 p.m. Eastern and Things We Said Today at 12 midnight. Also, you can check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, for lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles and Beatle authors as well, and for Beatles trivia, where you can win one of nine prizes every single week. And since once in a while I mention this, I want to do it again. There's a website called globaltexanchronicles.com where you can actually hear my syndicated Beatles show, Every Little Thing. There's a lot of shows there a lot of archive shows in the past so if you never heard that show before go to the website click on the ken michaels tab and there's a whole bunch of shows from the past with lots of great themes interviews and it's my other life outside of this show again you have, that's an- you have another life you have yes i do life. oh okay yes i do believe it or not Okay. It's uh, globaltexanchronicles.com. Okay, and you can get to me most easily through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. So that's it for this week, and thank you so much for listening. And for Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels, this is Alan Cozen saying good night and see you next time. Unless you're listening in the afternoon. <laughs> keep, keep that in. <laughs>